Total Syntec. Welcome to another episode of Meet the Grower. Today, I have a very special guest. Somebody who I consider a good friend and somebody who actually helps me moderate my Discord server. Today, Timothy's Crab Shack. Tim, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you very much, Matt. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm, I'm humbled. Hey, man, I am super stoked to have you here in chat today, mainly because of just that wealth of experience you have as a grower. And I know there's going to be some good stories because we talk a lot and we never shut up. So that being <laughs> said, before we get into it, shout out to Mars Hydro, sponsor of the show. Love you guys. Appreciate it. And if you like what I'm doing here, link down below. You can support me on Patreon. And there might even be a contest link down there. I don't know. It depends on when you watch this video. Otherwise, Tim. Let's talk, girl. Let's talk about you, Let's brother. Talk, Patty. Let's talk. Yeah. And, you know, as I start off with most of these episodes, before we get into the grow talk, I'd like to find out a little bit about my guest. Why don't you give us a little bit about your background and kind of how you came to be part of Timothy's Crab Shack? Well, uh, I suppose that's uh, it's kind of a big question with a, a lot of factors playing into the answer. Uh, how'd I get here? So I, I suppose you could say I'm a, I'm a longtime lover of horticulture. Um, I've had my hands in the dirt since I was a kid, uh, mostly influenced by both sets of grandparents, both of which were vegetable farmers. Um, and yeah, that kind of gave me uh, the foundational knowledge I needed to be successful, I think, in a lot of avenues of life, not just growing plants. Um, but uh, uh, how did I get to the photosyntax show? Let's put it that way. Uh, I started with social media about two years ago. Uh, I discovered you via YouTube. I commented on one of your videos, and I think we've been chatting pretty much steadily ever since. Uh, so that uh, there, that's the short condensed version. Let's put it that way. Oh, right on, right on. And you're definitely a guy who's got this very vast experience growing and you do a whole bunch of stuff. You got the vegetable garden. I know you've got some some gardening stuff in different places and whatnot. But what made you decide to really get into growing to begin with, especially this plant that we love? Yeah, so um, I've been a regular smoker for as long as uh, cars have been around. Basically, once the dinosaurs went out, Tim existed and he started smoking. Uh, but no, since uh, since high school, uh, my first grow, I was a teenager uh, growing in my parents' attic with uh, an HPS uh, back in, I'm going to say 97, 98, something like that. Uh, I soon after that, once I figured out that I really sucked at growing, I thought, okay, uh, uh, more lines in the water is going to equal more fish. So I started doing uh, kind of outdoor gorilla style grows uh, almost every summer uh, uh, again since I started. Um, and then I ended up actually aiding in a, in a rather large scale indoor operation during prohibition. Um, so, so about 2000 square feet, uh, about half a house, uh, full of plants. Uh, but recently, so since legalization, uh, I've made the move to indoor year round farming. Uh, like you mentioned, I, I'm still growing veggies and stuff, but I'm in a very unique situation here. Um, unlike a lot of you, I'm, or possibly like a lot of you, I'm, I'm doing what you call a micro grow. I'm, I'm in an apartment, uh, so I'm dealing with extremely limited space. Uh, so, so about three years ago, I started uh, growing inside. I realized uh, that the setup that I had in my kitchen wasn't cutting the mustard, and I bought a tent. Um, and since then, I've been, I've been tent growing. Uh, I call it a micro grow with macro results. So uh, I, I, I'm keeping it very small and, and putting out what I like to think of as high quality product with, uh, with a fair amount of volume, given the space that I'm working. Right on, right on. Now, describe your space just a little bit more. Like, I know you've got your nursery, you've got your flower space. Tell us a bit about yeah. that. I have a nursery maternity ward in the kitchen. Um, and then I have uh, two two by two spaces. Actually, if I just tilt my camera over a little bit, you can probably see the edge of my tent there. So, um, so yeah, basically, so I mentioned kind of the evolution of the grow process, moving from an attic to outdoors in the bush to a larger indoor operation. But uh, my current space and grow style is new to me. Uh, so three years ago, I started in the kitchen. Uh, 
I wanted to produce higher quality flowers, so I expanded on that kitchen with a simple two by two tent um, and some decent cob lights. And since then, I chucked another tent in there, got more lights, upgraded those lights. Uh, fast forward to now, I still run my kitchen setup alongside the two tents. So three total spaces, and this, uh, this has allowed me to achieve a near perpetual grow. Uh, so I'm harvesting every six to eight weeks on average, which is uh, more than enough for, for, for my usage. Ah, there can never be enough. Come on. <laughs> well, I mean, put it this way. I have oodles and oodles and, and I give away most of it. So yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's a good feeling to be able to do that and provide friends and family uh, with, with good, good quality medicine and recreation. Absolutely. And I, I love that just being able to give it away to, to those who need it. And it just, it helps further fuel the, the need for more legalities and just things to be, no, lessened up the stigma step. that stuff one, yeah one more step in the process of kind of uh, uh loosening that uh that grip that the stigma has so yeah, yeah i agree with you 100%. what do you think that we could do more of to help reduce that stigma other than just growing and educating um well uh growing educating you're hitting on two right away um i think legalization was definitely a major step in the right direction of course uh, and in that stigma. Um, but I think it's important for us, both as consumers and as growers to, as you said, kind of educate the naysayers, if you will, or let's call them the dinosaurs, because they're going to die off eventually. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so I think it's really important that people should try and prove that not everyone who consumes cannabis is a burnout. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people have the misconception that you're dealing with Spicoli every time you're dealing with a pot smoker. Uh, when, <laughs> He's a good example, but I mean, come on. <laughs> well, I mean, with us excluded, I mean, we're a couple of Spicolis, but there, there are people from all avenues of life, all vocations. Uh, there's doctors, there's lawyers, there's government officials who are all enjoying this, uh, but they hide it because their they're fear of judgment, their fear of reprisal, losing their jobs. Uh, so I suppose, long and short of it, I think the best thing we can do is be good ambassadors, uh, not hiding what we do in order to help drive further acceptance. So uh, what I'm doing right now, for an example, is showing my face to the public, telling my story. Uh, you do it on a weekly basis. I, th I think that's part of the, the, the integral pieces to the puzzle on that one. Um, but yeah, I, I, like you said, I think visibility and education are kind of the keys to, to breaking down the, the stigma that's still surrounding us. Very well put, sir. Very well put. I like the, the term ambassador because it really, it removes above the, the Spicoli mentality. And I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with the, the dude buddy dudes, but it's, it's, it's like you say, there's, there's so much more than that. There's doctors, there's lawyers, there's professional people that I know that I've worked with that prefer this, this plant over say a drink at night well, 100 percent. i mean none of those people are going to an after work party uh smoking a joint and wrapping their car around the tree on their way home yeah funny how that works you know? isn't it? so uh, you compare it to to the other devil that most people are imbibing upon uh, i think cannabis is definitely the the sell, safer uh alternative uh as a society <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And we're starting to go that way. And, you know, I applaud those who are bringing us in that direction. 100%. Talking back about the grow and more so your style, I know that you do a mix of organics and synthetics. Synganics, as some people would call it. Can you tell us a bit about how that, well, how you came to that, um, that method? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting method. A lot of people don't do it the way that I do. So um, as long as I can remember, or literally since I was five years old, uh, we've had a compost going at uh, my family cottage. Okay. Uh, this is where I learned the, the brunt of uh, organic farming, uh, building a, a complex ecosystem within soil, uh, getting complex inputs for, for that soil. Uh, it, I, I suppose what I'm getting at is I started out making soil, not plants. Yeah. 
So uh, it was a very, very easy thing for me to do in growing plants and getting good results because the soil that I was producing or the compost that I used in, in, in my mediums was already such a re rich input. Uh, so, uh, again, I've, I've, it's very, very rare that I've ever come into, uh, any, um, uh, deficiencies as far as nutrients are concerned, because the inputs I start with are, are, are so rich and complex. Now that said, where I started growing wasn't with compost. So I, I started growing in miracle Grow, uh, not knowing really my, uh, one appendage from another, I'm not going to use the terms that I normally use, but I didn't know my leg from my arm. Let's put it that way. There you uh, go. Keeping it clean. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I wasn't using the perfect soil that I had been using for veggies and flowers for so many years. And I was going with stuff that people had recommended me to use. Right. Uh, and, and I learned really quickly that that was, that was the wrong way to go. Uh, the, the results were not good. I had airy, larfy bud that was just, uh, I mean, it was smokable, but it, it, it was headache central and it tasted like barnyard. I, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, so let's fast forward to today. So what I do now is I keep that compost going every single year. I build up that compost during the summer and I let it cook over the winter and it's ready for me in spring. So I have three rotating piles. Um, I have different inputs in each pile. Uh, I have some that are heavier on, as you know, I do poop hunting. So I have some that are heavier on deer and rabbit poo. I have some that are heavier on bird guano. Um, all that said, what I do is I take a, let's call it a standard potting mix. mix. Uh, I mix that with my compost uh, and I add uh, perlite um and worm castings that's it that's how i start my plants so it's uh it's really easy now that being said i don't go full organic like you said i'm synganics so i cheat and uh, i have some reasons for my cheating so i i use uh liquid newts i'm not going to name them because i'm not sponsored but i i do use uh a liquid newt that is semi inorganic most of the ingredients in it are organic. It's got some great acids in it. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a really, really great product, but some of the sources of the ingredients in those products are inorganic and therefore it's an inorganic product. Okay. The beauty of this product is it allows me the ability to react very quickly to issues that I come across. And that's the why I grow the way that I do. Um, instead of painting all of my plants with one brush, I can really fine tune and go in there and, and, and mold the plant as I see fit and react as I see fit as things come down the line. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's different from a lot of people, what a lot of people are doing, but I think my results speak for themselves. And I think that, uh, again, it's given me kind of the flexibility to be on my toes. Uh, so uh, I, I enjoy that flexibility, and that's kind of why I've kept going in this route for the time being. Yeah. yeah. Never, never saying I'm not going to change. So, I mean, you guys have planted some ideas in my head for sure. Um, I'm loving the idea of these, uh, these earth boxes that everybody's growing. Oh, yeah. Just you know? So awesome. And, and that just pairs perfectly with the living soil bed, in my yeah. opinion. So uh, it's something to look at. Uh, really, the reason I've stayed away from going uh, full living soil is uh, really my space. Of so course. dealing with two by twos, uh, it really would be a challenge to get a two by two bed uh, big and healthy and complex enough for a no-till solution. Uh, so so that's really why I'm, I'm doing my, my Synganic route or fake Gannix, as I like to call it. Nice, nice. And, you know, to touch off a couple of things you said there, at last week's episode, we had KNF Garden on, and he very much does like what you're doing, where it's it's that controlled feeding based off how the plants react. He really brings it to the extreme. And if you guys missed out on last week's episode, um, go back and check it out. And the guy just dropped terrible, terribly large knowledge bombs. But, you know, talking then about the earth box, it's 
it almost feels like it's cheating at organics. It really does because it's so simple. Cheating at organics, it's cheating at hydro. I mean, it's like it's it's all the best cheating that you can do. It's cheating at self water yeah. system. Like it's, it's oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, That's I've cheating. I've heard of guys taking and running an airline down there, keeping the reservoir full of water all the time for a pseudo DWC soil thing. Yeah, I know. I'm 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 definitely thinking about trying that. Maybe like a side by side go. Honestly, when you when you mentioned that, I was like, okay, it's <laughs> all the wheels start turning. Yeah. Tim, tell me about your favorite grow. <sighs> favorite grow. Uh, I mean, every grow is technically my favorite grow. Is that is that a shitty answer? Yeah, let's give a better answer than that. Um, uh, I did a really cool can of bonsai a few years ago that was oh, just yeah. tons of fun. Um, I, I grow bonsai as well. Uh, not just can of bonsai, but regular bonsai. So it was really cool to try and train uh, with the constraints of a fast growing plant, like right. cannabis. Uh, so, so that was really fun. And I mean, I didn't get much weed out of it, but that's not the idea of a can of bonsai. It's really the form, the, the beauty. Um, and, and I had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but I, I think probably my favorite grow of all time uh, was actually recently as well. Um, and that's the resurrection of a line that I had going about 12 years ago. We've talked about it quite a few times, uh, but uh, it's a line of OG Kush where I stumbled upon one of those majestic unicorn phenotypes uh, that we all look after. I mean, that's really what my whole process is about right now is, yep. is, is pheno hunting and finding those unicorns. Well, I came across one um, and, and I ended up yielding just under 10 ounces in a two by two space. So uh, that felt pretty good. Uh, and it, it was 10 ounces of pure gold. So it, it nice. felt amazing, uh, which has resulted in, in me reversing the mother now um, and, and, and putting together some nifty gifties for my close friends. And a quick shout out to Wildwood Seed for that colloidal silver. Absolutely. I got a little myself. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Shout out to Wildwood. Uh, the, the guy is a mad scientist. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the autos that he produces are just works of art. And uh, I'm growing one right now, but unfortunately, I can't show it to you. Well, I mean, I can't. I'll, I'll be growing some later this fall. <laughs> Watch for it on Instagram. Nice, nice. And of course, I show all my plants on the weekly update, which I call the Grow Show, because that's when we show the plants that YouTube doesn't want us to show. <laughs> Tim, what do you think most growers tend to, to underestimate, especially the experienced grower? Their own abilities. I think, uh, I think growing a flowering or fruiting plant can and should be a very simple process. Um, I think there's a lot of, especially newer growers, uh, who doubt themselves they fall into the mistake of over complexifying the process with gadgets and fancy techniques uh, right out of the gate because they saw it on YouTube, no offense, <laughs> uh, or, 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 or Reddit. Uh, yeah. when, when in reality, it can introduce more opportunities for failure than success. So uh, I think for new group growers, especially um, trust yourself and trust the plant uh the plant's going to tell you when it needs something so provided you, you you train yourself to listen to it appropriately uh it's 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 going to tell you what it needs um and it'll tell you a heck of a lot better than the photo syntax show will on youtube yeah absolutely and and that that can't be stressed enough that what works for me and what works for you aren't necessarily going to work for everybody else. My space is a little bit different. My environment's a little bit different. My inputs, the way that I put together my soil is going to be a little bit different. I'm just here to help guide and, you know, provide a little bit of advice as, as you're taking that journey yourself, but certainly it's not the be all end all. And, you know, that's, that's the thing. It's, I, I so encourage everybody as they're growing to try it all, man, get out there, try the different methods that work, you know, see which ones really work for you. And that brings me to my next question, Tim, for each grow, are you following the same routine or are you experimental? <clears throat> so I'm always experimenting. Um, yeah. 
um, I'm always playing with certain variables variables because there's really an endless list of variables to play oh, with. So true. So true. Yeah, uh, uh, like you said uh, just just earlier, you were you were talking about how many variables don't listen to what I have going on because my basement is different than yours. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for the next because of the amount of variables in there to play with. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, I do have a very specific goal in mind. I have a game plan in action. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I do have a pretty rigid grow doctrine. Uh, I, I use the mother clone technique. Uh, so I'm slowly hunting out unicorn phenotypes. Like I said, I, it normally goes like this. I, I plant a seed, I take a cut, and I flower early. I, I, I do this for a multitude of reasons, but the main ones are A, the sex of the plant, if it was a regular seed. Uh, uh, be to test the terpenes, what, what the flavor of this weed is, is going to end up being and whether it's worth the effort of filling it in. Um, uh, learn the nutrient limitations so I know how hard I can push this plant without uh, uh, sending it to, to the, uh, the glue factory. Um, uh, learning growth patterns, so how a plant naturally wants to grow, whether it wants to branch out or whether it wants to shoot up in a pole or whether it wants to Christmas tree, that's going to give you ideas on how you can best maximize the plant when, when you're growing it a second time. Um, and, uh, and learning timing as well. So, uh, weeks until harvest, figuring out, you know, okay, what's the sweet spot for this plant? So those are kind of the main reasons I take a cut. And I flower first. Then I keep a mommy in my maternity ward. Um, and depending on the results of that first early flower, I either dump the mom uh, due to failure in that test run, or, or I take more cuts and I fill the tent for a full run. Uh, so it's it's either you're a winner, you're a loser. If you're a winner, fill in the tent, we're gonna pull out a half pound. Uh, if you're a loser, I'm gonna smoke the quarter pound that my tester plant gave me, and that's the end of that never picking it up again. So uh, experimentation wise, um, I'm always trying new nutrient recipes. I'm keeping my ear to the ground for you folks uh, on the Discord server and all the ideas that you're jumping, uh, throwing back and forth. Uh, new grow techniques, new training techniques. Um, and I especially love to push the envelope with environment. So playing with temperature and VPD is, is a lot of fun to see how a plant reacts, I think. Um, and that's, that's kind of where I'm at now. Yeah. With that. Nice. Nice. And VPD is the big one for me lately. Um, I was fortunate, uh, to do some work with Niwa and they'd sent me over a grow hub and that's the first chance that I've had to get VPD into the grow room. And man, what a game changer that is. I didn't realize how, you know, I far was outside of things and whatnot. Um, but just having that right piece of gear in, in the grow room definitely makes a difference. hundred percent. And that's a very cool piece of gear. So what do you feel the most important piece of equipment that you have is? I'm going to give you the cheesy answer that everybody gives you. Me. Yeah. So my hand, for a lot. my nose, my fingers, uh, you, you could take away every meter and gauge that I have and my senses could do a solid job of, of guiding the grow. Um, but if I was forced to say a piece of equipment, I, I'm going to go with temperature and humidity controllers. Nice. Uh, uh, be quite honest, that that was the 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 main automation that changed the game for me. Um, uh, I I wouldn't be able to grow the way that I do without them uh, because it's relatively hand off uh, hands off. All I'm really doing is watering and occasionally feeding. Uh, otherwise, I can kind of step away and I know that it's going to be the in the ideal environment that it needs so be it a seedling be it a clone uh be it deep veg be it in flower I can tune my tents and let it sit there and that's the other beautiful thing about tents I'll kind of add to that so uh a, a tent I think is, is probably secondary to those controllers for me because that tent allows you to really set up a microclimate yeah. Uh, uh, which is absolutely essential if you're micro growing. Uh, you, you can't rely on the climate of a larger lung room like I'm in now uh, because that fluctuates all the time and it's rarely, if ever, at the right 
uh, point for, for, for cannabis to thrive. Um, so yeah, favorite piece of gear, me, cause I do the best job, uh, but technical gear, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with uh, temperature, temperature and humidity controllers. I couldn't live without them. Oh, so important. So important. So important. And we've talked about this before that, you know, especially for the new grower, the most important thing above all else is making sure you've got that environment dialed in. I mean, having a good light is one thing, you know, that, that, that top of the line Mars Hydro that you can get versus, you know, an old school Blurpo. Well, if your environment is not good, it doesn't really matter how great your light is. I'll, I'll, I'll grow with that Blurpo light any day over the top end light provided I have the right environment. If you're giving me the option between the two, I'll take environment over light. There's a, a hell of a lot of lights out there that can grow a decent plant. Uh, there, there's not a lot of environmental situations that will. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. And that's the thing, you know, once you get that environment all dialed in and then you start getting that light, that, that really good light, and you find those and top you genetics. Oh, yeah, then you get good light. Dialed and in. Feeling Bingo. good. Bingo. Once in a while, we run into problems, though, and those problems can revolve around pests. And with all of your various experience, Tim, I'm, I'm sure you've run up against more than your fair share of challenges. Tell me about how you go about IPM now and maybe a couple of examples of when things didn't go so well. Yeah, so um, I guess my method now is really prevention and mitigation above all else. Of course. Um, we all eventually lose the pest battle. That's, yeah. that's given anybody who claims to never have pests. It's just a matter of time until it hits you. Uh, if, if you think you're immune and you have all of your preventative measures in place, there's going to be a pest that's going to mess you up. Um, so a couple of examples, uh, I, I can recall a time, and this is probably one of the, the rarest pests that, that you can come across. Uh, but I, 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 can't, I had a year where, uh, my entire crop was decimated by deer. So unless, unless you're growing outdoors, uh, it, it's not really an issue, but it's not something I ever accounted for. Geez, there's going to be a, a, a flock of deer that come in here. Is it a flock of deer? Well, we'll, we'll go with flock. That works. You know, we're not very scientific. Well, a flock of deer flew in. They landed. <laughs> they they ate all the flowers off of my plant. And oh. left nothing but stems, uh, and like chewed stems. So they were like chewing all along the plant. So it was literally just these long chewed poles left of my crop. So. <sighs> Needless to say, I, I laid down in the woods and had, uh, had a, a very good cry to myself and uh, planned appropriately for the next year as far as deer is concerned. I'm never going to let that happen again. I know what to do to avoid deer. And that's the cool thing about pests is once you get hit really hard, it's a hard lesson to learn, but you learn. And, and chances are you're never going to get hit with that pest in the same way uh, again. Um, so, so luckily indoors, I haven't had to deal with deer, um, but, uh, I've, I've had a few rough rides, uh, with thrips, uh, spider mites. I remember when we were growing in the house, we had a spider mite infestation, like you've never seen, uh, Google spider mite pictures, you know, those really horrifying ones where they're literally like capping the whole cola. Yep. That's what we had. And it happened within the span of three days. So it, it they can get out of control in a hurry uh, if you're not looking for them. That said, my IPM. Um, what I do, number one, is I keep healthy plants. Of course. And that is my, my number one tip for anybody. You want to avoid pests, make sure your plants are healthy. If your plants are unhealthy, they're going to be 10 times more susceptible to any type of infestation, oh, yeah. be it fungal or uh, insects. Um, Bless you. Uh, hey, mute. <laughs> yeah, I saw you sneeze. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I keep a really clean environment. So anywhere the plants are, I make sure there's not dust, there's not uh, debris, dead plant matter, uh, loose soil hanging around. I, I keep a very clean space. Now, that's not an option for everybody, especially guys running uh, living soil beds, et cetera. Uh, but luckily, with, with my style of grow, it, it, it works quite nicely. Um, and uh, I keep a stable climate. You mentioned that. Stable climates, those get out of whack. You, you, 
you suddenly uh, uh, get a big rise in temperature, you can make a bloom of something. Uh, so yeah. so yeah. It, it, stability is key there. Um, and then the other thing, if and when I do have problems, uh, I, I mitigate those with uh, beneficial. So, so predatory in, insects are your friends. Um, 100%. And, and the beautiful thing about them is once if, if oh, I don't want to have bugs in my apartment. Well, once they don't have anything to eat, they die. So there's no bugs left. Um, so, so, so really anybody who's fearful of introducing bugs into their grow tent, uh, shouldn't be when it's a predator, because if they don't have any, any, uh, uh, meals, they're, they're going to succumb to, to starvation. Yeah. Uh, so, so all of these things, they've, they've pretty much kept me knock on wood, mostly pest free for the past several years here in, uh, in the crab shack. Nice, nice. And it's just, you got to be vigilant about that stuff. Those who underestimate or think that they're never going to get pests, well, one day it's just going to run out of control and you'll have that problem before you realize it's there. Uh, and then uh, us guys in the background are just waiting for it to happen with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only because we've dealt with the pain, man. I couldn't imagine walking out to the field and seeing oh, I don't, nothing but I, stocks. Oh. I, I don't wish pests on anybody. It's a terrible problem to have. Oh, but. Absolutely. Uh, it's definitely not something uh, that's uncontrollable. Like I said, prevention and mitigation can, can really handle 99% of the past issues uh, that, 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 that'll come across your table. Oh, agreed, agreed, agreed. And that's the thing. It's, it's eventually going to happen, and how you react and choose to learn from the experience is what's going to make you ultimately a better grower. Absolutely. On the subject of things letting you down, though, and bad things happening, tell me about a time a piece of equipment did that. Um, I'm going to say the same thing as I did last time. Uh, I was that piece of equipment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most of the gardening problems I've dealt with were of my own making, right? Either through experimentation or, uh, caulking up in, in, in some way or another. Um, but, uh, if we really need to nail it down to equipment, um, I think it's really important to pay attention to your lights. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, so I was going through some light upgrades. I, I had bought a brand of light, which again, I'm not really going to plug because I, I don't have any sponsorships, but I, I, I bought a very, very well-known light, um, uh, good quality light, put it up. And uh, about two weeks after putting it up, I opened it up after lights out. I opened my tent up after lights out and the diodes were just faintly glowing like stars in the sky. Uh, freaked me out, did all sorts of testing, plug in, plug out, different timers. Uh, it was a mechanical timer, so I knew it wasn't a digital issue. Um, and as it turned out, it was a driver issue. That driver was holding enough of a charge to keep those diodes lit overnight till the yeah. next morning, which is brutal. Uh, luckily, it was on an auto flower run, so uh, it didn't affect it whatsoever. Uh, luckily, uh, but that being said, you should always test your, your lights, uh, before installing it. Once you get your timer set up, all that, plug it in, switch that timer or wait until lights out, set a reminder for yourself, go check those things and make sure there's nothing funky going on. Uh, because that, 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 that could be a nightmare that I wouldn't have been able to pinpoint what was going on right away. Right. Unless I stumbled across it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I've had my fair share of lighting issues. Anybody who watches the channel knows I've screwed up a couple of times with lights and it happens. But, you know, it, the takeaway from that is it's really good idea every once in a while, even once a week, to just poke your head in there when it's lights out. And make sure that there's nothing funky going on. Um, I mean, something might have a light on it. You don't even realize some of that stuff's really, really weird. Yeah, I have, I have a UV booster light in my, in my uh, flower flowering tent. Um, and I left to go to the cottage earlier this summer, uh, and didn't have that. So I had been plugging it in and out. I, I didn't have it on a timer because I just did it for like the last three, four hours of the day. And, uh, I left for the cottage and I left the friggin' thing plugged in. So I actually had to call, I had to, yeah, I had to call my next door neighbor and I said, climb the balcony. My balcony door is open, come in the balcony and unplug this light. And so I'm trying to give directions. This was at like two o'clock in the morning too. And oh, it's nice. weird. 
it just it just entered my head. I was like, I forgot the youth light. Click. So I called my friend two o'clock in the morning. He's been out drinking. He's hammered. And I'm telling him to climb the balcony to come in my balcony door. Yeah. And then try and explain which wire on my long power bar is the one that he needs to disconnect. Anyway, long story short, he saved my life. It could have been a nightmare. I, I was gone to the cottage for ten days. Right. Oh so, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. It could have been a real nightmare, but. Uh, Anyway, I digress. It wasn't a nightmare, but things can happen with your lights. And there's there's your lesson, ladies and gentlemen. Definitely check your lights overnight. And if you don't have them on timers, for God's sake, get a timer. Yeah. And if you do have timers, make sure that you plug into that timer and not the power <laughs> strip like I did the one time. <laughs> Still. <laughs> yeah 60 exactly. 60 hours of of light there going on in the grow and i just happened to discover it too but to that point i didn't have any issues after it because i did went and i let those plants get a good you know full on 24 hour cycle of dark and that's just my my tip is if you do have a light issue try and replicate the amount of time you had your lights on by having your lights off and give the plants to that rest Ex excellent advice i i consider it a reset and i, I, yep. I whenever there's a cock up i say a quick, quick reset the plants and that's what that means yeah no that's that's definitely a good uh, way to look at it joints dabs bongs or perhaps something different what's your preferred method of enjoyment tim I like suppositories ah yes the anal way <laughs> No, you know me, man. I, uh, I'm, I'm joints and, and blunts mostly. Uh, it's it's part of the ritual for me to, you know, bit it, roll it, lick it, smoke it. Um, but that said, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, exclusive by any means. So uh, I'm, I'm a joint smoker and flower smoker primarily, but I enjoy smoking hash. I, I enjoy bongs. I'm not agnostic, um, and and the occasional dab, even if I'm lucky, um, I'm happy to take when a friend offers. Uh, occasional occasional edible, if I don't have the opportunity to smoke, uh, or even the atomizing sprays are really cool if you're, uh, you know, have to do something in public and, and don't want to smell like marijuana. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, I'm gonna say 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm I'm rolling a joint. Uh, after work or on a Friday night. That's that's my process. Yeah. All about twisting the fatty. Yes, sir. And that's really why I'm on the pheno hunt too, right? Uh, because I smoke flour. It's important for me not only to get the terpenes that I want, which is really the, the main thing, uh, but also to get nice, dense, uh, smokable flour uh, because I'm not pressing it. Yeah, and that's the wonderful thing about growing your own at home is it allows you to quest for that stuff that you really like or that, you know, a loved one or somebody that you're acting as a caregiver for is after. Now, yep. tell me about the best bud you've ever had grown or possibly both. So many. Oh, so yeah. many. Um, I, uh, I, I guess... I'd probably say the best was due to my age and inexperience. So I, I'm going to say the best is probably like 1990s roadkill skunk or, or like old school white widow or, or red rooster that I picked up, you know? Um, but in reality, I know for a fact the weed that we're growing now is way better than what I was growing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've seen some interviews with with older people, uh, Tommy Chong, um, oh, that, was I know. Saying, that was saying uh, that weed back in the day was just as strong. Sorry, uh, no, no, uh, weed back in the day, and I'm old enough to tell most of the viewers here, as are you, uh, weed back in the day was pretty crappy. I mean, Canada, in, here in Canada, we've been really lucky. The quality here that we've had has always been very good, yeah. but compare that to today, uh, it's not comparable to it's 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 a, a, a different level uh, it's 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 a different echelon um, and yeah so I guess really I'm gonna say my favorite all-around weed that's probably the best in terpenes and, 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 and profile is probably purple kush that I've run myself nice uh, I've had excellent excellent runs in the past 10 years of PK uh, that have been a winner almost every time. Uh, but that said, did it get me as high as that 
joint of roadkill skunk when I was 15 years old? Probably not. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm all over the map, man. I, I, let's, let's put it this way. I like cannabis. Uh, do I have a favorite strain? Have I, I can I think of a, a, the best I've ever grown? Uh, I can, I can think of a dozen good ones that I've grown, but the best uh, it's nebulous. It's, it's, it's ethereal. Yeah. 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 There's so many good ones to try. And, you know, I, I, re- I know the exact interview you were talking about there with uh, Tommy on the, from the stash there. And I think a lot of the I, points. I, 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 I wasn't sure if I had said his name or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what he makes reference to is the fact that, you know, when he was younger and stuff and you get that first toke, it's like, it's going to knock you on your ass because you just don't know what to expect. So it's, it's like that first time experience with a lot of stuff because it's so new and so fresh. It's so memorable and whatnot. And I do believe that, you know, back in the fifties and whatnot, there was a couple of guys who really knew what they were doing, but compared to what it is now with guys like ourselves, um, and just the available knowledge out there, uh, we're all growing just the dank, and it's amazing. And bringing it up to that next level. Yeah, uh, I, I can say like uh, year one growers today are oftentimes pulling out better quality products than I was five years down the road. Yeah. No joke. So, oh, with the, the knowledge and like, the LED lights and again, just the knowledge. It's, it's, it's just awesome. Time. Yeah, this community is. But what can we do uh, more to help new growers out, Tim? Where, where, where can we as experienced growers really help them exceed? Um, well, uh, what can we do more of? Uh, how about what can we do less of? Um, I, I see a lot of people, and I, I mentioned it before, but I see a lot of people aggressively pushing particular methods, uh, equipment, uh, bro science at new growers, Mm -hmm. uh, when really, when you're starting out, in my opinion, less is more. Oh, totally. Uh, Yeah. So, so, um, yeah, uh, I, I think, I think we need to simplify, uh, the old adage of, of kiss, keep it simple, stupid, I think applies here. Uh, less variables means an easier time diagnosing and treating potential problems. Uh, less training, less watering, less everything, uh, I, I think is the key for a new grower. Uh, let the plants do their thing. They're going to tell you when they need something. Um, and, and when you mess up, it'll be your learning experience you can carry forward. By all means, I'm not saying don't tune into the Photosyntech YouTube channel. Do. He's giving awesome advice all the times. And, and he's going through a lot of the troubleshooting for you so that you don't have to. But that being said, don't try and replicate what he's doing in his grow room with yeah. his exact style. Because he's been doing it for years. He's gone through the troubleshooting of setting up that whole space. And... I can tell you it's going to be a lot harder to start out doing that than to start out growing a plant in a pot uh, with, with salt newts, for instance. I, I, and don't do that either. Don't do what I'm telling you to do. Do whatever you want to do, whatever you gravitate towards. Don't let somebody else tell you because it's your growth style. It's your grow. At the end of the day, it's your plant. It's your results. Nobody else is going to be benefiting it from it other than you and potentially the people admiring your photos. So uh, do you, and down the road, you can start pulling in ideas from Tom, Dick, and Harry uh, on, on YouTube and, and, and start incorporating, incorporating that into your growth. But until then, keep it simple, good quality medium, good light, good environment, let it grow. Absolutely, absolutely. Learning how to listen to those plants is, is such a critical skill that you need to have as a grower and when you stop trying to focus on all the other things around it and just let the plant talk to you you're going to find that you'll figure out what to do next quite easily yeah and you'll figure out how to do it better too that too that too for sure i mean you can always improve better at doing that every single time you recognize something that's in the knowledge bank and it's never going to that would be my amazon order (laughs) 
<laughs> dog goes nuts. That's right. We'll let her go nuts upstairs here. Tim, it's been fantastic chatting with you today. I know we were talking about only doing this for 12 minutes, but we've definitely gone a lot beyond that. Can you uh, tell me uh, what you think the next big thing for cannabis is going to be? Um, I, I, again, I'm going to be recycling some answers of your past guests, but I, I, I agree 100%. I think U.S. federal legalization is, is going to be the next big step. Uh, especially, I, I think that that is going to be a big, big factor in helping to end the stigma that surrounds cannabis. Yeah. Because most of the anti-cannabis propaganda uh, was derived from U.S. government, right? Uh, most of what people fear from cannabis was fed to them by government agencies, specifically in the United States. So I think if the United States were to go so far as to decriminalize this and expunge the records of the hundreds, millions, excuse me, not hundreds of thousands, but millions of people who have federal uh, criminal records uh, uh, because of a plan, uh, if they were to go so far as to expunge that and, and, and legalize it, I think that'll be the biggest step we could ever take towards ending the stigma. And, and then above and beyond that, I mean, I have friends in the States. I'd love to be able to send them some of my product and vice versa. Uh, and, and I absolutely look forward to the day. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm big on wine and beer. I love, there's some great American beer that I can buy here in, in, in Canada. There's some fantastic California wines I can buy uh, here, here at the liquor store. I long for the day that I can get some nice exotic weed from Oregon, some nice exotic weed from Washington State, uh, from Colorado. The, these are the, the things I'm looking forward to with legalization is we're going to be able to try these fruits that we haven't had ever before, right? So yep. uh, I, that's what I'm excited about uh, above and beyond just the, just the lessening of the stigma. Right on. That's a great answer. It's just, you know, it's been said on here several times that it's just really what needs to happen. And speaking of Amazon earlier, you know, maybe Jeff Bezos and the crew will help lead that charge, which would be kind of weird when you think about it. But hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. You know, yeah. if, 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 if that's the lobbyist that's going to take action, then I'm cool with it. Just take the fucking action already. You yeah, know? no kidding, no kidding. You have well over half of the, the mainland states have now passed legalization in some form or another. Uh, it's it's time to get with 2021, you know. Uh, yeah. Get in the now. <laughs> Tim. Live in the now. Stellar chat, brother. Where do people find you online, sir? Uh, you can find me on Instagram exclusively at mm -hmm. Timothy's Crab Shack. Uh, I'll post a link in the description where you will. We'll figure something. We'll talk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then otherwise you can find me on discord every single day. Uh, if you want to talk to me specifically again, ask Matt for a, an invite to your, to his discord. Uh, I'm there every single day as, uh, as one of the moderators. And, uh, if ever you have questions or anything, feel free to reach out either discord, Instagram. I'm always happy to help. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, like you said, just contact me, photosyntech1 at gmail.com. Love to have you on the Discord. Well, Tim, there you go. Been a stellar chat, sir. And hopefully the viewers have enjoyed it as well. I hope so too. And uh, keep growing. Definitely keep growing, guys. And that being said, yeah.